Derek Prince Ministries, proclaiming the inspired Word of God around the world. Derek Prince is an internationally recognized Bible teacher and author. Through books, audios, videos, and radio broadcasts, Derek seeks to reach the unreached and teach the untaught. In over 50 years of ministry, Derek has reached over 100 nations in more than 50 languages. And now, Derek Prince. Now, we come to the last of these three problems. I've dealt with guilt, I've dealt with shame, I'll deal with rejection. Now, I consider rejection to be the deepest wound of the human spirit. And I was reading recently something written about Mother Teresa after she had died. And she made this simple statement. Not being loved is the worst sickness. And I have to say, on the basis of my dealings with people over many years, I totally agree. The worst sickness is not being loved. And there are some of you here tonight, sick for that sickness. You may be Christian, you may be saved, but you've never realized what it means that you've, that you've been loved. You've never absorbed it, you've never taken it in. Now, there are various possible causes. Let me say, in the United States, where I spend some of my time, I would guess that this is the lowest estimate, 25% of the population have a wound of rejection. I think that's an underestimate. I think it's an epidemic. And I think it's not far, probably very much different here in Britain. It is the number one sickness in our culture today, due mainly to the breakdown of the family. Now I'm going to give you just some simple examples. They're by no means all inclusive. There are others I could give. But one of the commonest causes of the wound of rejection is a, a, a baby that's rejected in the womb. People don't realize that there's in that womb, in that embryo, there's a sensitive little person who wants to be loved. Now, at a certain point when I was conducting regular deliverance services in the United States, I saw that there was a certain age group that so commonly had the problem of rejection. So I worked it out, when were they born? The answer was about 1930. And if you're an American, the, the date 1929 is indelibly printed on your mind. It's the year of the Great Depression, when everything fell apart financially. Most people were out of work. Few people had enough to eat. And you can imagine a woman finding herself pregnant in that situation. She's got six little kids to feed already, and there's a seventh coming. And she doesn't have to take any violent action. She just resents that little baby. And that baby is born with a spirit of rejection. Now I believe my wife Ruth would permit me to say this. She was born in 1930 in a large, rather poor family. And she had that problem. She had a spirit of rejection. She was wonderfully delivered. But she told me, she said, that's something I always have to guard against, is rejection. It often tries to come back. Then every baby, as I understand it, is born into the world craving one thing more than anything else, which is love. That's right. And if parents don't love their baby, or may, maybe love it but don't know how to ex express their love, to manifest their love. You see, in unexpressed love does a baby no good. It's not a psycho psychologist, it can't work out well behind there, all that external, there's real love. It has to feel love. It has to have love expressed. And a baby that doesn't feel love, and I would say particularly the love of a father, if you'll forgive me ladies for saying that, I mean the love of a mother is wonderful, but the love of a father is particular. Let me say this, and I'm speaking from experience. My first wife, Lydia, 
was one of the strongest characters I've ever met. And she did a work in Palestine amongst Muslims and Arabs that few people would have had the courage to do. She was often without sufficient money. She often had even the missionaries criticizing her. But she stuck through it. And you know, I, I, thinking it over later, I realized one factor in her character was she was the youngest of four sisters. And she was her father's favorite. And he always affirmed her. And you know that makes all the difference in a child's life if the father affirms the child. And an unaffirmed child, it may be provided for. I was provided for. I mean, I had every need met. But I never knew in my family what it was to be loved. I mean, I was loved, but nobody showed it. We were, you know what they say, the stiff upper lip. Never show your emotion. Never tell people you love them. Just keep it cool. Keep it cold. I, I want to say this, it's personal, I find it hard to say it. But I'm saying it not for my benefit, but for yours. When the Lord took Ruth, it's the hardest thing that's ever happened in my life. And I made up my mind, I'm not going to be a slave of the stiff upper lip. If I want to cry, I'm going to cry. If people don't like it, that's their problem. But I'm not going to suppress God-given emotions because my culture doesn't agree with it. And you know what I think of... You know what I've observed? My family was a good family. They really were good people. But that stiff upper lip produces stunted, deformed personalities. They never really learn to express themselves. And something that's not expressed is something that's suppressed. So I've made up my mind, let people enjoy it or dislike it, but if I want to weep, I'm going to weep. I don't want to weep, but if I feel like weeping, I'll weep. And if I, feel, if I feel like dancing, I'll dance. The problem with me with dancing is, I used to be a great dancer. Believe me, I've led lots of congregations in dancing. But now, at this age in life, my, my feet just don't obey me. <laughs> so I stand there and tap my feet, but I can't really let myself go. Anyhow. Then another very common place where rejection starts is at school. <laughs> I was sent off to a boarding school in Westgate-on-Sea in Kent at the age of nine. My family has a photograph of me, ready to go to school. I was attired in a three-piece suit and I had a bowler hat on. <laughs> that was my culture. And when I got there, there were several other little boys of the same. And I remember one boy, he was uninhibited. He just started to cry. He said, I want my mummy. I want my mummy. I want my mummy. He didn't get his mummy. It was a hard life. British life has often been hard. You know that? I don't have to tell some of you that. We've, we've imprisoned ourselves in our own culture. I mean, you can understand, every male relative I've ever known in my life was an officer in the British Army. I was educated at Eton and went on to Cambridge. If anybody was inculcated with a stiff upper lip, it was me. But I rebelled. I decided I'm not going to be enslaved. If I want to dance, I'll dance. And if I feel like crying, I'll cry. You know, I've got a very good example. You know who he is? Jesus. Have you ever read this, the, the account of the, the death of Lazarus? Jesus arrived four days late. And when he went to the tomb, it says, the shortest verse in the whole Bible, two words, Jesus wept. He wasn't weeping for Lazarus because he knew he was going to raise him up. He was sharing the grief of Mary and Martha. And you know one thing about grief? It helps to have it shared. Oh, I've been so blessed, 
since God took Ruth home. I can't count the number of people that have shared their love with me. My family has been wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Three of my daughters came one after another to Jerusalem to look after me. First, my African daughter, Jessica. How many of you met Jessica? A few. Then my Arab daughter, who's here tonight, Kirsten. And finally, my Jewish, one of my seven Jewish daughters, Anna, who's here tonight, took me into her home. And she and her husband, David, gave me half the upper floor of their house to live in. I tell you, I'm proud of my family. And when I think how that family began, my first wife, Lydia, in 1928, took in one little dying Jewish baby girl. And everybody, all the missionaries criticized her. What's the good of that? Why isn't she preaching the gospel? Well, there's different ways to preach the gospel. You can do it in word and you can do it in deed. But if you don't do it in deed, it's not much good doing it in word. And out of that one little deathly sick Jewish baby whom God raised up, there has grown up a family of more than 150 persons tonight. I'm not, if I'm boasting, I'm not boasting about myself, I'm boasting about God. See, so many people want a big, impressive ministry. But I think most big things start small. I'm so glad. I was ignorant. I mean, I'd just been saved. I didn't know that the gospel was to the Jew first. But my first congregation was Jewish. It wasn't large and it wasn't old, but it was Jewish. And then the Bible says, pure and undefiled religion before God is this. What is it? How many of you can tell me? To care for the orphans and widows. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. So I cared. I started by caring for the orphans and widows. <laughs> I wasn't spiritual. God just thrust me into it. It's the last thing I would ever have planned. But I'm oh so glad I did it. Another common reason for rejection, all too common today, is the breakup of a marriage. A woman has given herself unreservedly to a man, and like Brother Ed Cole was telling her, a pastor turns up one day unannounced with divorce papers. What is such a person to experience? You've given yourself without reservation, you've done everything you can, you've loved, you've served, and suddenly you're no longer wanted. Anybody that doesn't feel rejection in that situation has, have, has got to have a very close walk with the Lord. And then one kind, other more kind of rejection, and I'll come to the end of this little list, is self-rejection. And again, that's a terrible problem. You'd be amazed, or maybe you wouldn't be, how many people reject themselves. I think especially women or girls. They're just not the right length. Too long, too short, too thin, too fat, eyes are the wrong color, hair's not straight or it's kinky. Whatever it is, you've made it a reason to reject yourself. And you look at other people and wish you were like them. You know your problem? Self-rejection. Now, I want to tell you the remedy. It's found at the cross. In Luke 23, Verses 13 to 24, we have the scene when Jesus is before Pilate. And Pilate is trying to get him let off. And the more Pilate tries, the more Jesus' own people shout, let him be crucified. I'll just read it quickly. 
Then Pilate, when he had gathered, called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who mis mis misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in him, in this man, concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing worthy of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him, for it was necessary for him to release one to them at the feast. And they all, now this is all the Jewish leaders, they all cried out, saying, Away with this man, and release for us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain insurrection made in the city and for murder. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them. But they shouted, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said to them the third time, Why, what evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of those men and the chief priests prevailed. How do you think Jesus felt? His own people, to whom he had come, turned him down, rejected him, in favor of a robber and a murderer. Don't you think that you or I in that situation would have felt totally rejected? And I believe he did. But that wasn't the end. Going to Matthew 27, verses 45 and following. Now Jesus is now on the cross. Now from the sixth hour unto the, 19, unto the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. The rest said, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried out again with a loud voice, yielded up his spirit. He didn't die of the wounds of crucifixion. People crucified could live sometimes 12 or more hours. What killed him? Tell me in one word. Rejection. That's right. And it was bad enough to be rejected by his people. But now he was rejected by his father. And out to his agonized cry, there came no answer. Because Jesus was identified with our sin, God had to deal with him as he would deal with sin. He closed his ears and he averted his eye. And Jesus died of a broken heart, not of the wounds of crucifixion. What killed him? In one word? Rejection. That's right. That is the most terrible wound the human heart can ever experience. But the next verse tells us why it happened. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. That's the thick curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. And only one man could go through that, the high priest, only once every year. But when Jesus died on the cross, that thick curtain was split in two from the top to the bottom. In other words, it was God's doing. What did that indicate? That by the death of Jesus on our behalf, the way was open for us into the presence of a holy God. Jesus endured our rejection. Now in Ephesians 1, in the King James Version, we have a wonderful, beautiful account of that. Just a brief summary. Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 6. Well, I'll take verse 5. Verse 4. Just as he chose us in him, Jesus, before the foundation of the world, 
that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to, set to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. So Jesus endured our rejection that we might have his acceptance. Can you see all the evil came upon Jesus, that all the good might be offered to you and me. And it was all resolved by one sacrifice on the cross, by one sacrifice he has perfected forever us who are being sanctified. He never needs to do another thing. It's all done. All we have to do is appropriate what he has done. So now I want to give you an opportunity to receive what God has provided through the death of Jesus on the cross. I want those of you who still have a problem with guilt to receive total forgiveness to receive the verdict of the court of heaven, which pronounces you not guilty. Those of you who have a battle with shame, and I know there are many here tonight, I want you to receive your healing, bearing in mind that on the cross, totally naked, Jesus bore your shame, that in place you might share his glory. And for those of you who struggle with rejection, I want you to receive your healing tonight, bearing in mind that on the cross, Jesus was rejected by his Father, the ultimate and cruelest of all rejections, died of a broken heart because he bore our rejection, that we might have his, what? Acceptance, that's right. You see, as a child of God, you're not just tolerated. You're welcome. You don't have to apologize. You don't have to make an appointment. You can come any time and the Father will always welcome you because you come through Jesus. Now I want to help you if I can. And it's not all that easy, but I'll try my best. If you have any of these three problems, or all of them, guilt, shame, or rejection, and you want tonight to claim the healing which has been provided for you through the cross, I want to lead you in a prayer, bring you to the cross, and then let the cross do its work in you. So if you want me to lead you in prayer for either guilt, shame, or rejection, and you're ready to do it now, I just want you to stand to your feet wherever you are. Don, would you come up and stand with me? Isn't that a sight? Well, you receive it by faith. You don't have to struggle. You don't have to improve yourself. You don't have to make yourself good enough. You just have to believe what I've been preaching, Amen. that on the cross, Jesus bore your shame, your guilt, and your rejection. And begin to thank him. You no longer need to be ashamed. You no longer need to feel guilty. You no longer need to struggle with rejection. Jesus has done it all. And you can walk out of this place tonight feeling that a load has been lifted from your shoulder. You can be free. Free. So I want you very simply to say this prayer after me. I can't have it rehearsed. I'll pray as I feel led. Will you say these words? Lord God, I thank you that you know my problem here tonight. You know what I'm struggling with, whether it's guilt 
or shame or rejection. I thank you, God, that your word clearly reveals that on the cross, Jesus endured all three. He endured guilt. He endured shame. And finally, he endured rejection. That I might be delivered. That I might be free from guilt. That I might be free from shame. That I might be free from rejection. That instead of feeling rejected, I can know I am accepted by God my Father. I belong to God. I belong to the best family in the universe. I have nothing to apologize for. I don't need to be ashamed. I don't need to be second class. God has no second class children. And I'm one of them. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Now, as you stand there after that prayer, I'm going to pray for the Holy Spirit to minister to you all that you've prayed for. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your love and your mercy and your faithfulness that on the cross you permitted Jesus to endure those agonies of guilt, of shame and rejection that we might be delivered, that we might be set free that we might know we're no longer guilty. We no longer have any need to be ashamed. We are no longer rejected. We're children of God. We belong to the best family in the universe. Father, let this truth penetrate now into the hearts and the minds of those who are standing before you. In Jesus' name, receive your release. And thank God for it now. Begin to thank him. That's the purest expression of faith. It's just thanking him. You can't do any more. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. But you can thank him for it. Just take plenty of time to thank him here thank tonight. You, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We hope the Lord has spoken to you through Derek's teaching and that you'll see the fruit of it in your everyday life. If you'd like to order today's message to listen to again or pass on to a friend, please contact our office for details. You may also request a free copy of the DPM Resource Guide for information about other Derek Prince books and tapes. Do be sure to join us next time when Derek will share more from the richness of God's Word.